I've got your statement and, and I know that um, it's, it's a kind of, it's a nicer way for us to have a chat about it rather than any kind of formal readings or any of that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I wanted to start, um, if I can, unfortunately, it's probably one of the more traumatic parts of your story, but I wanted to start because it's where you start about the experience as an 11 year old when you became pretty unwell. Ah, yes. That was the psychosis, wasn't it? That I was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You talk about, you know, going into an inpatient unit and ambulances and a whole range of things. And I guess I, I want to know what was your, what happened for you? What, what, what was it that you were experiencing at this time? And how did that feel? So I don't, I've had stuff come back to me. Um, and like my memory is absolutely so things come and go like things I may have said before I may not remember right now or sure. you know I've got things that come up that I might not have said that I remember uh, so I just I thought I'd mention that because sometimes people kind of go didn't you say that and I'm like yeah I because of apparently it's because of the complex trauma disorder all my memory just kind of went in the toilet so I remember being terrified I remember there being an ambulance there like this is during the episode where I actually blacked out I grabbed a knife I know that and I did that twice and when I kind of went around with a knife I remember uh, I remember nearly getting hit by a train actually because I nearly I, I went out to the train station at one of the little episodes and I nearly stepped out in front of the train but I, the, the loud, the train blared its horn, obviously got sensitive hearing. So it kind of made me move away from that. Um, and when I kind of got the police managed to eventually, I snapped out of it and the police managed to contain me. And I, the, the patients were very, like, I remember I was, I don't remember when this was, hence why I'm bringing it up now. But I remember walking around in that little area saying, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. And then I had this other patient come up to me and go, you are home. And that just sent me absolutely off. Um, that was one of the few positive times I've actually had because they removed me and put me out in the courtyard with a bucket of chalk. And I was just allowed to draw out in the, like, I, that was probably one of the only ex positive experiences I've had where they sort of turned around and went right you like you, you like drawing so we're just going to sit you out here in the courtyard while we deal with this um it was yeah it was it was an interesting experience being in there as a kid and you know as a kid you didn't have very many negative experiences because you're a kid they try and sort of shelter you they try and keep you a little bit more safe it's when i became an adult that everything kind of went <laughs> went down a little bit more but right and they they didn't want to take me off it either my mum ended up because they want they thought it was going to settle and it was going to pass but my mum wasn't going to deal with another it took two times of me going psychotic for my mum to say no so i'm going to come back to because you talk a bit about the transition from child to services into adult and you know i think that's another part of your story um, just talk to me a little bit about, you know, you, you were expressing, as far as I can tell from your statement, you're often expressing, you know, a kind of quite strong sense of distress. Um, and sometimes you sort of say they helped you. And sometimes obviously something like what you're just describing sounds pretty terrifying. Yeah. Um, what, what did people do that helped you at those times? Like what, what sort of helped the 11, 12, 13 year old Kiva get through some of this? What, so what as I said, when I was younger, they were nice to me. They were, they, they were sympathetic. You know, they, they, I dare say took me a little more seriously, oddly enough. Um, and you know, they, they kind of turn around and go, you know, it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. This is only temporary. We're going to help you. You're going to get better. You're going to be fine. They had a light tunnel in there, had weighted blankets. They had all sorts of little, little things in there that, that, you know, from tactile to scent to, to touch and, you know, visual, like the, like the light tunnel. Um, 
and the sensor room helped in leaps and bounds. It made me feel like I had somewhere to go. I actually fell asleep <laughs> in the sensory room at one stage because I fell asleep in the light tunnel and they actually looked for me. I didn't realize because I, I was exhausted and I'd obviously gone in there to calm down and I've curled up and just zonk, which Perfect. doesn't happen these days because I'm here, but <laughs> um, it was, it just speaks volumes that it was a safe place. I felt safe enough to fall asleep. I felt, you know, safe enough to go up to the staff and go, I don't like this person. This person's making me very uncomfortable. And I guess being believed as well. There were some, some instances uh, as a child where they kind of went and looked at you a little funny, but most of the time they were very sympathetic, very understanding because obviously you see a distressed, you know, I may have been a teen at that point, but you see a distressed, you know, minor, a distressed child and, naturally they're going to go and try and comfort the child and as soon as i hit 17 18 that just left when you were in the um under 18 year old program did you want your family to be involved you know i know in your statement you say at one point your mum's getting you know finding it quite distressing and so kind of wants you to get support somewhere else but yeah you know i'm guessing she was around at other times as well so yeah, did my you mom. want your family to be involved and how did that happen when you're in the so my mum was very involved right. i i don't remember if she stayed with family at that point i actually can't remember where she stayed um because one of them set off the fire alarm in the middle of the night because it got too hot in that back room but my mum, i know my mum was was constantly like visiting whenever she could obviously she couldn't be there all the time and but like she she was kept in the loop she was kept informed um and i wanted her involved because she's my mum she's been there with me through thick and thin and i couldn't have asked for a better woman to raise me honestly but my mum was the only family i really allowed near me at that point because my mum you have other family oh yeah i have a big family (laughs) right so um, she was the one that you wanted to kind of have with you and supporting you she was my rock. Right. She was there. Okay. Um, you, I guess you do, you, you've raised it already, but you talk about how things changed when you went to adult. Do you want to talk about what happened at that point? Yeah. So you know how you can kind of tell sometimes someone's just not believing you or they give, they kind of give you that, that look that says, you know, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I'm really not believing you. A lot of that came up, like, a lot of people turn, like, I've had, I actually had someone blatantly say, come on, you know, I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's what's wrong. I think you're fine. I think you can go home. I think you're okay. And <laughs> I actually got so used to the hearing that, that I eventually just said, I'm fine. Let me go home so I can finish the job. And they'd send me home a lot of the time. I've had a couple of times where I was brought back to the emergency department because I'd, I'd attempted again sorry so, so is it just about your level of thoughts of self-harm they're not believing you about or is it kind of a like is it um, in you or is it kind of about you they're not believing so i had voices oh. um a little while ago it it's since subsided but i had voice and like the minute you start talking about hearing voices and because a lot of them sort of took control in a sense if that makes sense like I blacked out almost like I wasn't there anymore and from what I can remember of it the the things that I can pull from my memory they didn't believe me they didn't look like like they they still thought Kiba was sort of in control if that makes sense but at that point I was kind of I wasn't really I was there but like I wasn't in control I, I wasn't in control of what I was doing and unfortunately, struggling through that, a lot of psychiatrists kind of looked at you like you'd grown, grown, grown a new head. And they kind of almost wait for you to stop pretending and stop putting it on, which <laughs> made it worse because I was trying to work through it. And in the end, I ended up actually naming, because I, 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 I linked in with Mind Australia, and I can't sing their praises enough because they actually help me. Um, they help me put names to these different voices that I was hearing and um, help me put names to the 
to the the voices that were taking control when I lost control, if that makes sense. And that, that made dealing with that really hard. And it was actually mine that ended up pulling me through that. And then one day the voices just stopped. I, t I don't know what happened, but the voices just stopped. I don't want to be in hospital. Mm. Who wants to be in hospital? But that's what, that's how they treat you. They're like, yeah, but you're fine. You can go home. You'll be all right. And that was quite often what I dealt with. It, it, as I said, it got, to, I just went, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Go home. And they believed me and sent me home. It, what did that feel like for you when you kind of, I, I, I think you can say, no, Alex, it's not exactly what I thought, but it sounds like you kind of gave up on it that, you know, that you, you, you were kind of experiencing all this stuff, but you gave up on that system to help you. So you just kind of went, okay, right, yeah, I'll go. What, yeah, if I if what, I was brought into say to you about <laughs> well, if I was brought into hospital, it just said you know if you tell them the truth, they're gonna think you're lying. So lie, tell them what they want to hear, so they can send you home, so you can finish the damn job. Right, and it incredibly scary. You feel awful. <laughs> and it's scary as well, yeah. Yeah, like the, yeah. I felt so, hopeless, so, hopeless more than anything, actually. Right. Yes, you talk about that a bit in the statement about. That, that, that it, it started to really impact on your sense of self-worth on, on, you know, how you were feeling about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It made me actually at a point, I was like, is this, am I making this up? Am I doing it? Am I doing something? Is my brain sort of, am I, am I, is this real? Am I making this up? Of course I wasn't making it up, but like, if you get told enough, you're making it up. You're not, you know, this isn't what's happening. This isn't your issue you're faking it, you're putting it on. If you get told that enough, you start second guessing yourself. <laughs> like if you're told enough time that the sky's not blue, you're gonna start, and that's an odd comparison, but if you start getting told all this sort of stuff, you start second guessing yourself and you start sitting there thinking, you know, am I putting this on? Is this something that I can switch off, so to speak? And it, <laughs> It was an awful feeling. It was an mm. absolute. Mm. Is, is there anything, I'll, I'll come to mind in a minute, but was there anything that they were doing that helped? Like, you know, it was, you said there was sometimes a couple of people that seemed a bit more approachable, but was there anything that went on during that phase that seemed to be useful to you? There was one person that um, kind of helped because <laughs> melatonin, because I've got insomnia, was really expensive to buy as a prescription. And that's pretty much the only instance I can. So one bit, one bit of practical of. information, <laughs> one bit of practical information. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, unfortunately there wasn't really much positive out of it. Okay, so then you find MIND. Um, and and what, what's the difference at MIND? Why does that they listen feel to you. different? They believe you. You know, they sit there, I, I went in, but I sat down, I told everything to my worker and she looked at me and went, I believe you, we're going to work through this. You're going to be okay. These are manageable. I know, I believe you. I believe that this is happening. Now let me help you fix it. Let me help you cope with it. Instead of dismissing me, they kind of sat there and went, yeah, okay, this is happening. This mm. sucks going to get through it we're going to come up with some strategies and we're going to get through it and they brought me out of my shell got me into groups and because i'm very introverted believe it or not um and they got me into groups dungeons and dragons they got me into dungeons and dragons as soon as they said oh we're thinking of this we're thinking of doing a dnd &D group and i'm like yes yes i'll come to that <laughs> and i do i do cooking i went on a couple of retreats with them and they just pulled me out of my shell so I can't, I can't sing their praises enough. They listen to you. They make you feel like, you know, you're worth something. You're being listened to. You're not just a number to them. You're a, you're a person, a person who they feel they can help, which is fantastic. At mine, did you run into um, other young people, you know, more um, that were sort of experiencing some similar, probably never the same, but <laughs> similar things to, to what you were? Yeah, I actually met someone with BPD as well. <laughs> Pardon me. I mean, there wasn't very many my age. I was pretty much the youngster. <laughs> right. um, 
Did that matter? Not really, especially in the dandy group. God, no, that didn't matter. Um, the great equaliser. Little... A great equaliser, isn't it? Oh, yeah. They, yeah. Like, they're, we're all just a bunch of nerds. <laughs> we're all a bunch of nerds sitting there playing a playing a role-play game. And it was ne- the age thing never came up. Like, we're just a bunch of nerds hanging out. And even, like, in the cooking group, like, I felt if I was uncomfortable, I could go to the staff. Or if I felt uncomfortable with a certain client, which I've, I've had happen, they're happy to, s- to sit down and go, okay, Kim, but we're going to do everything we can to put a safety plan in place and make sure that this person doesn't make you uncomfortable anymore. And so, so that kind of makes it able for you to stay in that broader age range because you've got things that support you in that age range. Like um, a lot of the staff were younger, not as, not as young as me, but a lot of the staff were younger. My support coordinator is actually younger as well. Like she's fantastic because she, she kind of gets, she, she, she gets me and she's able to sort of sit there and go, okay, Kiwi, you're not comfortable. So I'm going to do everything I can to sort of alleviate that discomfort. I know this can be a bit intimidating. Um, And, you know, the staff were very approachable, which is something that made, if I was uncomfortable, it made the world a difference if I was actually able to go up to someone and go, I'm not comfortable. I I think I want to go home now. (laughs) So again, like, but a lot of the, a lot of the clients were so friendly. Like it didn't matter. They didn't, they loved seeing like a a young face around. Like they were, they were like, what's your name? And then come up to me and they'd sort of sit with me and they'd talk with me. Um, I hated it at first because <laughs> little introverted me did not like people, but eventually, you know, with a bit of encouragement from my workers and a couple of the more outgoing clients, you know, I was able to sort of go, yeah, I can, I can talk to these people. I don't think the age gap really matters. I can talk to these people. Mm. And you talk about that a lot about how you've come out of your, you know, I think you say come out of your shell, but you've, yeah. you know, you've kind of, um, you've found a different way of interacting with the world really, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it showed me that it's okay that I'm afraid of people. It's okay that I'm deathly afraid of them. It's just, I need to find ways of like, I, I often do that, which is apparently um, stimming. <clears throat> And I, cause I used to try and force myself to stop that um, because family members would actually get annoyed. <laughs> so, and then I was told, no, 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 it's actually stimming. It's, it's something that autistic people tend to do when they're stressed and it's a way of coping. So once I was told what that was and um, you know, that it was perfectly okay, it became one of my strategies and it's just, it's, it's fantastic. Really mind has changed a lot of the way I've, seen the world like as i said i used to think the whole world was going to kill me if i tried to step out into it but they've made me kind of realize it's okay you know it's the world's not going to kill you you're fine (laughs) i actually reason i went into tafe yeah i'm currently studying what what are you doing so i'm doing cyber security certificate four right and that's fun i'm I'm learning to be a hacker ironically can um, i just say i think you'll never not be employed <laughs> i know we need lots of people in this space oh yeah they they sort of, sort of turned around and said you couldn't have picked a better profession in this day and age yeah, it sounds like it might play these no things issue. yeah and they said you will have no issue getting a job no issue whatsoever so so, so do you Brilliant. do tafe online or i mean it's at online the moment, at the moment. yeah yeah it was face to face which was fantastic because as i said like it's just and in class, it's just a bunch of nerds. Like nothing's taboo, nothing's off subject. We just joke about absolutely anything. And even even in online class, we just send memes into the chat all the time and laugh at gifts that we send to each other. So it's it's I wouldn't I, without mind. I don't think I'd be where I am. To, I don't think I'd be in TAFE. So yeah, can I just say it's mind and it's Kiva. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's it not is. Just oh. mind. Well, yeah, I, I don't like giving myself credit. I, yeah. I'm learning to, I'm learning to, but it's taking me, like I'm in DBT at the moment because okay. I've, as I said, I've got BPD. So that's can, been interesting. Can, can I ask um, that we swing around to this diagnosis that, you know, because you've mentioned it a few times. Yep. Someone at some point has said, this is a way of explaining what you've been experiencing is that, mm-hmm. that you know, you amongst many other aspects of your life, you also have BPD. Yep. 
Um, so I had a psychiatrist that actually like? who said that. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So he sort of said, so you get jealous. Because I was, I was bringing up the jealousy and he's like, so you don't like it when your friends have other friends, do you? And you don't like it when your mum, you know, because I used to be very possessive of my mother growing up. Like if she was dating someone, I'd do everything in my power if I didn't like them to take the attention away and eventually split them up. Um, and he sort of said, okay, it's one of two things. It's histrionic personality disorder or it's borderline personality disorder. I want you to go home, research them both and tell me what you think. And I came back to him and said, you know, borderline fits a lot of what I'm feeling. I had absolutely no idea what borderline personality disorder was. Um, I was scared by the word personality in the disorder because we all know how seriously that gets taken in the mental health system. Um, So I was was hesitant, but as soon as I got the diagnosis, I realised there was help out there. Um, So, you know, just just for my kind of understanding, it's quite a stigmatised diagnosis as you, I think, you know, are with me on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, some of that description about what's happening to you is that other people are starting to make that diagnosis and are sending you home in relation mm-hmm. to that. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> but um, was it helpful for you to have that? I mean, all it is is a way of explaining oh, well, yeah. some of the part of your world. It's not doing anything mm. else. It's just no. sort of saying this is one way that you could think about what you've been experiencing is that a yep. helpful thing or was it not a helpful thing? Because I think often that's an interesting thing for, for different people. At first, I couldn't stand the idea of it. Yeah. Like when I first got diagnosed with Asperger's, oh my God, I, I, I tried to get as far away from that as I possibly could. But eventually, like I, I did more research on borderline personality disorder. I looked up a bit more about it and I looked up what treatments there were. And so I sort of went, okay. This is a little bit confronting, but it's just a word. Mm. You can, I can deal with this. It's just, it's just a word. I'm going to be fine. And sort of, I pushed away all of the thoughts of, oh my God, this is going to ruin me. Cause that was a big thing that came up was now yeah, no one's going <laughs> to, now I'm not going to get any help. Um, and so I sort of went, no, 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 I'm not going to think like that. I'm going to push past it and I'm going to work on, okay, this is what I've got. Let's start working on it. So, I mean, through your research, you you obviously discovered that there are really good treatments for mm-hmm. people with borderline personality disorders. So you've kind of tracked into finding someone to help you with that. How hard was it to find the DBT? <laughs> my first run in with DBT, I wasn't going to do it again because it was a group. I was thrown straight into a group setting with no one-to-one support. And that blew up in my face. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the facilitator was uh, a bit of a female dog. (laughs) She, She was really cold. She didn't want us talking about anything remotely you know, if, if two of us, if two of the clients started, you know, talking about stuff that we're comfortable discussing, should immediately shut it down because we couldn't talk about that even in the break. We couldn't talk about anything. So, and like every time I started getting, strict. yeah. And every time I got like really distressed, she's like, you'll be fine. Just come and sit down with the group. You're all right. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. And kept pushing me to try and sit down. And like every time I wanted to actually go home, she's like, you know, you've got to stick to this. If you're going to do DBT, you've got to actually stick with it. As if I'm, I'm as if I'm living all the goddamn, like I was trying to stick with it, but she made me feel like I was the worst person in the world for even thinking about going home because I'm mentally unwell. And eventually that culminated into a massive suicidal episode. And that didn't, that didn't end well. So I ended up stopping abruptly. Right. So, so talk to us about how do we manage in a, like, cause we've got to think about a whole system here and, and what you're describing is something about right fit. Yeah. Maybe this woman, as you describe her, <laughs> might work for other people and good, but for you, it wasn't the right fit. The style wasn't the right fit. Yeah. So, so you then kept trying and found someone that has been the right fit, which is fantastic. Oh. But, 
I didn't keep trying. I actually, my, my OT, I wasn't going to do it again. I was flat out not going to do it again. And I eventually just went, you know what? What have I got to lose? As long as it's not group therapy, I'm fine. Sorry. That's right. Do you need to answer? No, no, no. I'll, I'll call them back. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I guess my question, Kiva, is that if someone had said to you before you went in with the first person, look, um, well, did they say, I should ask this as a question rather than a statement. <laughs> yeah. Did someone say to you, look, you know, sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work. If this doesn't work for you, then we'll help you find another solution. Or were you left thinking if, you know, you weren't a success, let's say, you know, and I'm doing success like this for this. If you were a success in, <laughs> yeah. in that program, then that was your only shot. And, yeah. So, so yeah. is that something we need to think about is explaining to people that sometimes it takes more than one go. Sometimes it takes finding the right person and mm-hmm. no, one, no one kind of approached it like that for you. Oh, uh- Someone did say, I think it was one of the clients actually, when I was in the meeting, he said, Oh, I take, it took me a couple of years of doing this to actually for it to, for it to sink in. But no one beforehand, not that I can remember ever said, if this, if this blows up in your face, there's no harm in going away and, and doing it again when you're mentally able to cope with it. So it it felt like for you at the time, this was your shot and it wasn't working. And therefore that's why I think you described just then that it became so distressing for you. You were thinking of um, harming yourself in some way as, as the kind of part of that distress. Yeah. Yeah. It ended up, I I ended up walking out in hysterics, calling my mum and saying, mum, I'm, I'm, I want to die. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I can't do this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get anywhere with this. You know, I I don't want to be alive anymore. Stressful, Um, but it's, it's, it's going well. Yeah. 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 That's fantastic. Are you still with mind? Yes. Yep. I have a support coordinator through them at the moment. I did have a worker, um, but then COVID happened (laughs) and they weren't able to find me because my, my worker actually left and they weren't able to find me a replacement. So. What makes her fantastic? Tell me about what, what, what do you think are the magic ingredients of the fantastic worker? Casual. She's not afraid to, you know, talk to me about, you know, what's going on in life. You know, she's, I went and got a coffee with her, you know, going out and being able to sit back and forth and exchange stories, not just me talking to her. She also talks to me about stuff, you know, that's relating. Like if I tell her a story and she comes up and she sort of thinks of a story in her life that was similar, she'll share. And like, not everybody's obviously comfortable doing that, but she's just, it's like sitting there with your best friend. And it's like sitting there talking with your best friend who has a mental health degree, who can actually help you with your problems <laughs> instead of a best friend that goes, eh. <laughs> it's a best friend that goes, oh, hey, that actually, you know, I think I have an answer for that. So it's, it's like a best friend with a degree <laughs> is the best way I can describe it. And it's a good description. <laughs> And, you know, because I often get very intimidated um, if someone is too professional, if that makes sense. Like, I often go, "Mm, I can't bring anything up. I'm just going to, yep, okay, I'm being polite, yep. And then oftentimes I just won't show up to appointments. If you're too professional, I get scared off. (laughs) Um, I've had a couple of that where I've gone to my case manager and gone, I don't like this work. (laughs) They're too strict. They're too serious. Help. and quite often I've been moved to a different worker who's been a bit more relaxed and, you know, cause you know, and, and this, this might be a me thing, but I, I do try and bite my tongue, but I tend to swear a lot <laughs> and she just doesn't care. They're just like, eh, swearing's a part of life. You know, eh, some people get offended by it, but we're fine. We're, we're fine. You can swear if you want, which, Have- Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, have you run Sorry. into any peer workers in in your kind of progress through different groups? Mm, I think I have actually. I've come across a couple, not not with what I had. Obviously, like I'm, <laughs> I don't think many people in my shoes would be comfortable, like with my condition moving. Like, that. like I thought about it for a while, and then I thought, you know, 
if a, if a client has a similar story to me, that's just going to blow up in my face. I'm not going to cope. So sure. no, I didn't mean such, I just was wondering if you've run into any help to support you and whether or not you found them helpful, but you haven't, not so much. You've had much. people with um, depression. Say, I've actually had a couple of people with depression and who have had anxiety and like they've, they've turned around and gone, I get it. I've got depression or I get it. I've got anxiety. I know how that feels. And that, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, running into people who know what it's like to hit rock bottom, what it's like to feel numb, what it's like to not want to be alive anymore. You know, you, you come across people who go, come across healthcare professionals. I've had this and it pissed me off something chronic um, because they turn around and they go, I know how it feels when they, when they don't. Like it's all good and well sympathizing with someone, but if you haven't gone through something similar, like if you say, talk to someone like I've got depression. If you said to me, I know how it feels and you've never had depression, but you've never hit rock bottom before. Don't say that. Like there are different ways to word it. Mm. Like say, you know, that must be really awful. I don't know how that feels, but I can only imagine something similar to that. Like don't turn around and claim to have been in your, to be there. Sorry. Don't claim to have been in their shoes. If you haven't Mm. that, drives uh, at least it drives me up the wall because then it's kind of insulting in a way like I try not to let it get to me but it's it's insulting because it's it's it almost seems like you're downplaying what I've gone through because you've got a medical degree or a psychology degree I've had I've had I think it was a psychologist I had that had that mentality of I know how you feel and he he really did because he'd not he'd not been there like you can read about it sure you can read all the books in the world, but unless you've actually sunk to the very bottom of what you can cope with and you've actually sat there and thought, I want to die, then someone who hasn't been through that can't say, I know how that feels because they don't. Yeah. And I, I, it's probably a me thing, I'm, but I'm very, very passionate about that because it... Even though I shouldn't take offense to it, it's, it's insulting. <laughs> yeah. No, I get that. I, 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 no. I, um, I have a personal perspective on this, which is that no one is in anyone else's shoes. Yeah. Everyone yeah, has yeah. a unique experience. So you can't ever say no. you might have had similar or you might have yeah. a perspective, but everyone has an individual experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted, uh, I'm just kind of keeping on the idea about that reaching out to people who um, have had a different journey and a different experience, but kind of somehow um, might have something to offer. Have you found any groups online or anything else? You know, have you kind of entered the digital space of peer support in the sense that there's, you know, you've kept away from that? <laughs> yeah. Is I, that a deliberate I, thing? Is yes. That a, yes, that's deliberate. And, and um, why? I don't like, I don't like being in those sort of environments. Like it was, um, it's fine if it's in like a leisure setting, like cooking classes at mind or a retreat at mind, but like being in an environment full of people who are similar to me or have had similar experiences to me terrifies the crap out of me because I, I don't know what to say. You know, I, 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 I'd, I've been offered, you know, groups like that because I'm transitioning from female to male and I've had groups offered to me in that regard. Uh, but I've, I've just, I just haven't wanted to. Um, mind you, uh, I guess this kind of counts. I role play and I've met a lot of people. I've met another, another trans person online. You mm-hmm. know, I've met someone else with autism, you know, who, who gets what autism feels like. Um, and I've met someone else face to face who had BPD. So I have a lot of online friends and a lot of my online friends get where I'm coming from, but never really, I've never really sought out a group really. Right. So, so if you have through your connections, people who you can have conversations with about experiences, that's one thing, but you're not, um, you haven't experienced any benefit from going particularly to um, an online group that, that is going to spend time talking about um, an identified issue. 
Mm. That's not uh, sort of been your thing. Not really. I'm more, I more cope when someone sits down with me one-to-one -one or in a very small group of two to three people. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I kind of lose myself in big groups. I just kind of shut off and I don't retain any information, which I think issue with the group DBT because I really wasn't absorbing anything because I was just scared because there's so many people there. Um, so I, I avoid that. I, I, okay. I do try to avoid that. Okay. All right. No, I understand. Um, cause a little bit, one of my questions, which we've been asking lots and lots of people is how is COVID making, um, <laughs> you know, what, what is that doing to your capacity to get the support you want? Um, that you need or anything else that's going on in your life. So we've talked a bit about the tapes going online and you prefer it face-to-face -face than online, I think, is what you were just saying. But but have have you had any other experiences where COVID has either given you opportunities you wouldn't have had or has actually gotten in the way of things that you'd be preferring to do? It has helped. You know why? Because in Tech Ready, in the classes I'm doing, um... We've had people from Microsoft, you know, we've had people from oh, Apple. Cool. We had someone working who was on the visual design team for Marvel movies. Wow. We've had all people from all over coming in for tech ready that we wouldn't have had face to face. So that's been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But I lost the ability to actually use one of my biggest coping strategies, which was the park across the road. Cause the park's closed quite a while there. <laughs> right. They're open now, thank God, but I often go over because I'm I go on the swing and I just swing back and forth for a few for like half an hour to an hour. I lost the ability to do that, which I hit rock bottom a couple of times during that and I felt, you know, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't approach the hospital at the moment, you know, with COVID. Like I've actually been tested for COVID. I'm negative, thank God. But you know, it it made reaching out for help a little harder. And again, this is where mine helpful in leaps and bounds because they've kept me sort of, they've kept me in the loop. They've kept me, you know, in, in the know-how of how to get help. You know, I, I see a worker. Mm. So COVID and, and been, does that work yeah. for you online? Does it work for you um, seeing the worker online or would you prefer to see the worker with the cup of coffee face-to-face? Yeah, -face? prefer, yeah. Um, that never stopped the face to face with the worker never stopped for me, which was good. Oh, okay. uh, but we kept, right. we kept kind of a distance. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, my OT and I have seen each other face to face, which is a problem for me. Cause I, I, I like seeing her face to face. Um, and, but my, my psychologist and I did a couple of zoom ones and then he was still offering face to face. So I kind of jumped at that and sort of went, eh, yep, nope, I'm clinging to that. That's yep. I'm going back to face to face. You know, I mean, obviously you're completely tech enabled. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yet, you know, that, that, and probably spend quite a lot of time online and various things. So it's interesting that, that when it comes to some of the more personal supports, you, you've you got a preference for face to face. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's right, isn't it? That's what you yes. say, is that yep, you've got yep. the preference? It's because ordinarily I don't get out of the house. I don't have my license yet, but I'm getting there. And I just, I'm too paranoid to go for a walk. So oftentimes those face-to-face -face appointments are my getting out for the, <laughs> for the day, you know, are my getting out of the house for the day. So it's, it's often, it makes me feel a bit better about sitting on my butt all the time <laughs> is getting out and actually seeing the people face-to-face. -face. And it, it puts me out of my comfort zone as well. Oh, that was awful before I had transport because I had to take the train up there. Yeah. And I, I was usually at three and a half hours at the train station waiting for the train to go home. Like, so it was, it was a test of my ability to cope when I was, you know, taking the train. Uh, and now that I've got transport, it's even better. It's, <laughs> it's even, it's even easier because I can mm. come straight home. Mm. Mm. No, so imagine that three hours at the train station. Can't be that much to do with the Aubrey <laughs> train station. Uh, I have my laptop. So it was usually homework. <laughs> Actually, you've mentioned homework, which at the moment is the TAFE um, homework. Um, I just wanted to track back to the, you know, pre-leaving school. You've described, I mean, you know, you're describing, and I only understand bits of your story in this short time we've got together, but, you know, you're describing at 11, you know, 
pretty being pretty unwell and um, it sounds like you had lots of other contacts with the system. What happened to your schooling during that period and did school um, was there any aspects of the schooling that were helpful? Because I wasn't there long enough for the f I think it was the first time I wasn't there long enough and the second time I was there a week and a half so they put me into the school. So one of the things we're interested in is for um, uh, when we're talking about the system and the kids still at school, where's the relationship between, you know, the schools picking up on kids that are, you know, in distress or counselling or any of that stuff, or they're expecting the mental health system to pretty much... They're expecting the mental health system. Yeah. And okay. I, I've got complex trauma disorder because of all the crap that I've gone through when I was growing up. Yeah. And, you know, when you... Again, it falls back to when you're not believed and when you're told enough times get over yourself you, you're fine you, there's nothing wrong with you you sort of fall into a vicious cycle of beating yourself up and going yeah there must be something you know there must be nothing wrong if if they if, if you're being told by someone who's in the field you're fine i must be fine it must just be it must be it must be me it must be something i'm doing <laughs> And so that's your yeah. fine stuff, which you were talking about right at the beginning. Now I understand was much more loaded for you. You know, like it, it kind of was loaded in, in a lot of this um, really difficult trauma that you'd experienced. Yeah. 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 And, and so, there's something about the system understanding the person in front of them so that they don't then exacerbate it in the way that you're describing. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know when someone comes to you saying they're hearing voices and that they lose control from time to time and something else takes control, don't look at them like they've grown a new goddamn head. You know, we're not there. Well, I can speak for myself. I wasn't there. The last thing I wanted was to be stuck. Mm -hmm. Did not want to be there, but I knew I had to be there to get help. Yeah. And every yeah. time I tried to reach out, as soon as I turned 17 or 18, but how brave like, of you yeah. to keep trying. I mean, honestly, it was remarkable that you kept trying. But um, I did give up after a while, I have to admit. But Yeah, but it, I mean, there's something really strong about, you know, going, I, I've still got to keep trying. I've still got to keep going. I've still got to find other solutions. And, and I think, you know, you, look, again, it's really brave to do that. because I appreciate that. Um, in a system that is um, turning you away, it, it, it's really easy. Well, it's not really easy. It's terrible. But... Um, you know, to keep going back in there. Yeah. Pretty, pretty resilient of you. <laughs> um, I want to, and, and again, if we're raising stuff today, that's going to come back for you because, you know, none of this is an easy story. You, you do keep reaching out and keep in touch with your own workers as well as yes, any yep. of our guys who will make contact um, mm -hmm. after this as well. Um, we've got a little bit of time left and, and um, I want to kind of end on, on, you, um, you know, giving your view about what would have made it your experience different and what are you telling us we should do to make other people's experience different? So from your kind of time through the system, we've talked a lot about, you know, shut up and listen to the person in front of you and, and believe them. I think that's one of the things you were saying is that politely, you know, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be polite. Of, yeah. That's kind of, I think, a given yeah. across this conversation. Exactly, yeah. Um, sensory well, rooms. Yeah. Put in, and let me tell you. I'm, I'm going to write these things down, just by the way. So that's okay, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I despise the colour white and the sterile environment. Yeah, Make it more colourful, please. Okay. <laughs> like, I felt very uncomfortable in the adult psychiatric like i felt very comfortable in the children's ward Sh should we ever send an 18 year old to an adult ward uh probably not uh but that could just be me i've i've i may be 21 but my mentality is very childlike still in a lot of aspects like i you know i cuddle a teddy bear at night you know i still call my mum you know when when shit goes wrong and you know, I, I enjoy playing with things like building blocks. I enjoy, you know, playing with very tech dial, like toys, what people would call toys. Um, I don't, when I'm being thrown straight into the adult psychiatric facilities, I, the only comfort I had was the TV, actually, because I could watch ABC for kids on it. 
and I, I still watch ABC. Like I'll sit there and watch a compilation of Peppa Pig or Fime and Sam, but <laughs> that could just be a me thing, as I was saying. But you know, bring a little more but, color. But I, I don't know. You, you're telling me that as you've been feeling a bit stronger, hmm. interacting with adults has actually been like a real positive for you. You know, like kind of in your groups and in other yeah, places yeah. where you've got something to be doing. Yeah. I, I wonder if there's something different about when you're acutely distressed, that wasn't something you could easily do because you were just surviving your own. Yeah. Experience. Like I did not cope with patients, other patients. Mm. Like I, I remember a couple of times this, this lady came up to me and she just sat there and talked to me and I was giving her every sign under the sun that I wanted her to piss off without directly saying it. Um, mm. And she she just wouldn't leave me alone. I actually thought yeah, she was she staff might have been, initially. Yeah, she might have been well meaning and doing all that. Yeah, but yeah, it wasn't like she was friendly, could, but it wasn't what you could manage. Yeah, she she was friendly and like a lot. I think staff need to be a little bit more vigilant with stuff like that. Like maybe ask of a morning, hey Kiba, are you up to interacting with patients today? Like if 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 we see a patient interact with you, do you want us to intervene? And if I say I'm really not in the mood and I I don't want to interact with other patients today and I directly put myself out because I will do that. I will put myself in a spot, usually in front of a TV or in front of my laptop or iPad and I'll curl up and I'll avoid patient interaction. I'll put myself out of the way. Um, and usually I've had patients come up to me <laughs> and if I think if staff do see that and like, you know, that patient doesn't want interaction, from anybody other than the staff that need to talk to them obviously to kind of gently like guide that patient away like <laughs> bring that patient away because unfortunately it it when I'm in that state that I need to be in hospital I do not want to interact and it can make me worse it can make it can like become distressed because I I struggle to turn around and say I don't want to talk to you go away like, I, I struggle to say that because I don't want to offend them. I don't want to upset them. Sure. But unfortunately, that just brings a cycle in my head of, yeah. So I think, I mean, I wonder if you went to sleep in the the sensory room. was The sensory room was nice, but it was also it probably had a door that was shut and you were able to feel alone. So, you know, I think you're saying there needs to be more capacity in the inpatient units to find... Um, respite places or healing yes. places or I, I don't know how you want to describe it I don't know the words you'd use for it but something yep. about being able to remove yourself when needed yeah and have to, like things that I can fit with like tactile things sensor yeah. this is why I say sensory room because if I have a place where I have a whole bunch of stuff that I can fit with like kinetic sand or you know slime or building blocks or just something tactile or a way to blanket I nearly got into a fight with a patient and they got me to lie down on the floor and they put away the blanket over me and I nearly fell asleep <laughs> mm. because it calmed me right down. And like having the ability to sit in front of a TV curled up sometimes and not be bothered <laughs> because a lot of the times like I curl up in front of the ABC for kids because it, it helps me get inside my head and just sort of relax it takes all the tension away. Um, unfortunately, some other patients want to watch the news. Yeah, it's just having more options, escape options, really. Um, well, you talked to me a bit about the beds. This is in your statement now. Just, I just <laughs> got out the recommendations bit yeah, from the, the back beds. of your statement. <laughs> you, you talk about not having enough beds and, and that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, one of the things we are interested in from the commission point of view is those should for young people those beds be fit for purpose for young people so um and and one of the questions and, and just say look you don't know but if you'd been transitioned at 25 instead of 18 would have that made a difference for you hell yeah yeah it definitely would have because i think as soon as i turned i think it was actually 17 they started trying to push me into the adult sector I wasn't ready. <laughs> I I get overwhelmed and unfortunately it when you throw someone who's still a child in their own like the, I may have physically been 18 but back then my, I was still very childish in a lot of my mannerisms and a lot of my 
you know, like I sat in front of the TV and watched ABC for kids. That obviously annoyed some of the other patients because they wanted to watch other stuff. Like mm. I, I, I wasn't ready to be put in an adult facility. You know, I, I just wasn't ready because it was, it was overwhelming. And, you know, they're very cold. I felt they were very cold in the adult facility as well. They weren't very, they weren't very friendly. Like I had a cricket in my room. And I sort of, I'm terrified of bugs. I don't do bugs. Um, and I went to the nurse and I said, there's a cricket in my room. And she's like, yeah, what do you want me to do about it? And I'm mm. like, I don't know, get a cup, get rid of the freaking thing. I don't want it in my room. Like I stayed out of my room the entire day. And I was really nervous going, you know, going to bed that night. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so be a little more yeah. empathetic, I think, and, you know, understand. Yeah, and, and that, I'm sure if, yeah. if your mum was here, she's not, but I'm sure your mum was here, she'd say that there was something about the transition that meant that she got left behind as well, so. Oh, hell yeah. My mum was yeah. furious with the system. They were not telling her anything, and she yeah. couldn't help me if she didn't know. Um, you talk about the white, so I think we've got that. You, you, for you, the... There was some equate there was like the white was about sterile and cold and unwelcoming for you yeah and it was terrifying yeah but I, I i hate hospitals and if it was more inviting a little bit more friendly i think i'd be more inclined to actually go there to get help is there anything else that you think you want to add to things that as a commission we should just really keep in mind when we're trying to think about services for younger people again training staff to be a little bit more empathetic and understand that it may just be a, like i'm using this as an example but it may just be a cricket like that may not be a big issue yeah, to a staff example, member though. but to me that cricket was huge it was black and it was terrifying and i it had it been removed from my room i would have been fine but no <laughs> i was met yeah. with what do you want me to do about it like it was almost a teenage response but like I'm also not I can't be angry at them because like they're, sh they're short staffed they're overworked but I still think like you got to think about the patients as well yeah absolutely don't 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 stop thinking that I won't don't, don't worry. stop striving for that pain because that's worry. absolutely true <laughs> they do need to think about who's, who's meant to be getting the help in this space exactly like I get you tired and you're cranky that's not my fault <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 no that's very nice of you to be being empathetic to them, I guess. Um, I have many more things we could talk about, but I am at the end of our time. Okay. And I think sometimes these things are, you know, they're quite tiring being on with mm -hmm. us for an hour. <laughs> Is there any last comments, you know, that you want to make for me? Um, could I be kept in the loop about what happens? Because I want, I don't want what happened to me to happen to anybody else. What, what I went through was garbage and you know if I can help one person even one person by talking to you guys about the crap that I went through I think it'll be worth it I think well, it'll, I, it'll be worth I, it. I can only assure you talking to me is helping lots of people because <laughs> you know that that we get to make recommendations that the premier said he's going to implement and oh hearing good. from people who um have a, you know a lived experience that informs us about how to make improvements and how to think about this differently is just so important so fantastic and and great contribution absolutely you can stay in the lead and i will leave the others to describe to you how to, how that will happen um and you know that the, the conversation today i mean you have such a, a light within you so um i want you to know it, it's it, oh, thank a, you. It's a joy to talk to you. <laughs> thank you um, so much. I appreciate it. I, you know, just wish you all the best. You, you know, and and fantastic things like the TAFE and you getting through your DBT and all those things yeah. that are kind of happening for you now um, is terrific. And um, thank to you. your credit, to your oh, credit. thank you. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. It means a lot. It's been a great time with you, and I wish you all the best. And thank you, thank you for talking to me. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> I okay, appreciate bye. it. Bye. Bye. <laughs>